Let's cut the Earth in half. You can see all of its layers. Here's the inner core. It's about 40 times hotter than the inside of your oven. That's the mantle, an ocean of hot lava. Here comes the crust of the Earth, the solid surface on which our civilization lives. But if you look up, there are many layers besides the atmosphere and the ozone layer. Scientists recently discovered a strange bubble here, which protects our planet from radiation. And nope, it's not the Earth's magnetic field. This bubble is made of radio waves. Our planet grows like a Christmas tree in the radio spectrum. But we're interested in low-frequency waves, the ones that let us keep in touch with submarines. So, radio waves are like light waves, or regular ocean waves. Look at this one. The distance between the two peaks is the wavelength, and the number of these waves over a period of time is the frequency. For example, there are 10 waves in this interval of one second. So, can you guess the frequency of this wave? Yep, it's 10 hertz. Cell phones use waves with a frequency of 300 to 3000 megahertz. So, add six more zeros to that number. But waves of that frequency don't penetrate barriers well. Think of how you lose your cell phone connection when you're driving through a tunnel. That's because there is metal inside. It's a conductive material that weakens the radio waves a lot. Salt water is also a kind of conductor. So, if the submarine is deep enough, the thick layer of water weakens the signal and we lose communication. To maintain it, we send fewer waves but make them longer. In the same amount of time, the frequency of the short waves will be much higher than the frequency of the long waves. That's why they're called very low frequency waves. But as it turns out, these waves travel all over the Earth and even into space. This is where things get interesting. The waves collide with particles of radiation from the sun. We think of the sun as a friendly giant giving us light and heat but it actually emits a lot of harmful radiation. Each flare, or the electrical discharge of material on our home star, causes an even greater burst of radiation. These particles fly to our planet, just as radio waves do. They travel 93 million miles from the sun to Earth in eight minutes and crash into our bubble, which acts as a shield. Basically, radiation particles from the sun accumulate in the radiation belts around the Earth. Our planet's magnetic field traps them, and a recently discovered bubble of very low-frequency waves lies right below this radiation belt. It helps us repel some of the harmful emissions. Analysis of old studies confirmed that the radiation belts used to be much lower and closer to Earth. But when our civilization began to use radio actively, our waves raised that belt higher. No one expected such an effect from simple radio waves, but it'll give us a way to protect astronauts in the future. When you're on Earth, its magnetic field keeps you safe from radiation. You can physically see it when charged solar wind particles make the air particles at the poles of our planet glow. This is an aurora. Next time you admire this beauty, know that it's actually the Earth saving you from some extremely harmful rays. But if you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, somewhere in space, I have bad news for you. Nothing protects you there. This is a big problem for astronauts, who spend months on the International Space Station. Perhaps scientists will learn to create protective bubbles of very low-frequency waves around space stations and spacecraft. The same is true for other planets. We're probably going to colonize Mars. There is no magnetic field there, and nothing can protect you from radiation. But if you create an artificial bubble there, you can reduce the harmful radiation. Another invisible bubble protecting us is the atmosphere. It's like a layer cake or an onion. Each level of the atmosphere has its own properties. The lowest layer that we live in is the troposphere. This layer contains 80% of the weight of all the air on the planet. It's also the main place where water vapor lives. And this is where the machine called weather works. The sun sends rays of energy to the Earth. Our planet's surface reflects them and heats the air in the troposphere. This makes it move and change places with the cold air. So all the wind, cyclones, storms, and tornadoes only happen in the troposphere, up to about 7.5 miles high. That's why commercial planes fly at an altitude of around 6 miles. The wind or other bad weather conditions hardly affect this area, and the air here is not as dense as it is down on Earth. Flying one mile above sea level is like moving through a biscuit. It's hard, but at a 6-mile altitude, flying feels like moving through light whipped cream. The plane almost feels no resistance, so it's a win-win. They save fuel and keep the passengers safe. 
A couple of significant downsides are that it's very cold, and you can't breathe there. It's cold because there are very few air molecules to absorb heat from the ground and transfer it to each other. You wouldn't be able to breathe here for the same reason. That's why planes are equipped with oxygen masks, just in case. Let's go a little here. This is the stratosphere. There's even fewer air molecules up here, and that's where the weather probes fly. They're the kind of small balloons with computers people use to predict the weather. This part of the atmosphere also contains the well-known ozone layer. This is our shield against harmful ultraviolet radiation. Ozone is almost the same as oxygen, except it has three atoms in it. When harmful ultraviolet rays enter our atmosphere, they crash into the O3 molecule. The ray breaks the molecule into O2 and another oxygen atom. The ray itself is converted into heat, but the ozone regenerates quickly. A single oxygen atom joins the O2, and the ozone molecule is ready to protect us again. It's the invisible shield that protects us from radiation. It gave birth to all life on Earth. As our civilization developed, we started to emit freon gas into the atmosphere. We used to fill our old refrigerators with it. A single chlorine atom would detach from a freon molecule when in the air, and then it would bind a single oxygen atom. Now, the ozone can't regenerate like it used to. Fortunately, we banned the use of such harmful gases and the ozone layer began to regenerate. Scientists expect it to fully recover in the middle of the 21st century. The stratosphere ends at about 31 miles. The next layer is the mesosphere, the coldest of them all. On average, it's about negative 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's five times colder than your freezer. This is the layer of the atmosphere where incoming meteors start to ignite because of friction in the air. Then they will eventually burn up completely. The air here is too thin for airplanes or balloons to fly, but it's still too dense for satellites. So, this layer of the atmosphere is not well studied. The next layer extends from 55 miles above sea level to about 500. That's a little more than the distance between Las Vegas and San Francisco. Carmen Line is situated in this layer of the atmosphere. This is the boundary between our planet and space. The thermosphere is where all our spacecraft and satellites fly. It's also home to the International Space Station. The temperature rises extremely. The air here is about 10 times hotter than your oven can produce. It's all due to solar activity. But you would never be able to feel this heat. The air molecules that carry the heat here are so small that you would literally float between them. Imagine a giant pool with only three drops of water. That's the thermosphere. And the highest layer of our atmosphere is the exosphere. This is the widest layer of our air bubble. Scientists believe its boundaries are about halfway to the moon at 120,000 miles. This is the point where the pressure of solar radiation begins to exceed the Earth's gravity. It's still part of our atmosphere. This means that astronauts who went on various space missions and have been on the ISS have actually never left the Earth's atmosphere. What happens when a star runs out of its fuel? First of all, paradoxically, it grows to a million times its original size. You see, when the core of a star runs out of hydrogen, it starts contracting under the weight of its own gravity. But some hydrogen fusion continues in the upper layers. While the core contracts, it heats up. This causes the upper layers of the star to heat up too and expand. The radius of the star increases. As the star grows, it engulfs any matter, even its own planets, in its wake. Astronomers have watched stars right before or straight after swallowing entire planets, but until recently, they have never seen the process itself. Scientists from different universities have reported that for the first time in history, they've observed a star swallowing a planet. And this tragic event happened not somewhere in a faraway galaxy, but in our own Milky Way some 12,000 light years away from us. Astronomers spotted an outburst from a star, which is around 0.8 to 1.5 times the mass of our sun, near the eagle-like constellation Aquila. It became over 100 times brighter than usual in a mere 10 days, and after that, it quickly faded away. Even more interesting, this white-hot flash was followed by a longer-lasting signal that was also colder than the first flash. And this combination, my friend, could only mean one thing. 
the star engulfed a nearby planet. What planet was it? Astronomers believe it could be a boiling hot world from 1 to 10 times the mass of Jupiter. Such planets are also called hot Jupiters. They're giant exoplanets similar to the Jupiter we have in our solar system that need less than 10 days to orbit their stars. The planet we're talking about had been gradually spiraling toward the star until it was pulled into its atmosphere and, eventually, into the core of the perishing star. This galactic feast happened between 10,000 and 15,000 years ago when the star was about 10 billion years old. And given its respectable age, the swallow itself happened lightning fast in one fell swoop. This is very different from other hot Jupiters, which were quite delicately nibbled by their stars. Astronomers aren't sure if there are any other planets orbiting this star, perhaps at a safer distance. But even if there are, thousands of years will probably pass before they become the star's main course or dessert. In any case, now that astronomers know what they should search for, they're going to be on the lookout for more cosmic gulps. Because one day, our planet, as well as part of our solar system, will suffer the same fate. Everything around us will be gone in a flash. But you may relax and breathe out. It won't happen for another 5 billion years. That's when the sun is supposed to burn out and expand so much that it will swallow the inner planets of the solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. If people manage to colonize some other world by that time, which should be at least 10,000 light years away from Earth, they would be able to observe this catastrophe. The sun would suddenly become much, much brighter, and it would eject some material into space. It would swallow several planets, including Earth, before nonchalantly setting back to what it was. But stars are not the only things in the universe that swallow other space objects. There's another kind of cosmic monsters that munch on everything, even light. Have you guessed? Right, I'm talking about ruthless black holes. But what is more interesting, they not only devour stuff, but also seem to spit it out. Not so long ago, scientists found out that the supermassive black hole at the center of our home Milky Way galaxy seems to be leaking. Why is it a game changer? Because it might mean that this black hole, called Sagittarius A asterisk, whose mass is 4.1 million times the mass of our sun, isn't a sleeping giant as previously thought. It might still be active, and this leakage may be the whole hiccuping while swallowing clouds of gas. During the research, the team of astronomers used the Hubble Space Telescope. It helped them spot a jet that looked like a blowtorch. It was pushing into clouds of hydrogen at the center of our galaxy. The jet seemed to spew gas like a hose directed into a pile of sand. This often happens around active black holes, surrounded by the material, pulled toward them by their immense gravitational pull. Some of this material gets into the black hole, but a small part of it gets swept outward by powerful magnetic fields. The research suggests that when a giant gas cloud gets too close to our supermassive black hole, it gets swallowed, and then the hole belches mini jets of matter. Fermi bubbles might be the result of the belches that happened around 2 to 4 million years ago, but recently, scientists have discovered another giant glowing bubble of hot gas. It aligned with the jet stretching for 35 light years or more from the supermassive black hole. Astronomers suspect that the jet could have plowed into this bubble of gas and inflated it. Now I'll tell you something even creepier. There seem to be black holes that might be eating each other. Well, kind of. They're actually trying to share their meal at the moment. But who knows what will happen in the near future. But let me go into detail. Astronomers have spotted two supermassive black holes feasting on the cosmic material of two merging galaxies in distant space. These giants have been located with the help of the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array of Telescopes, also known as ALMA. These telescopes are in northern Chile's Atacama Desert. Scientists originally used them to watch two merging galaxies located about 500 million light years away from Earth. Astronomers have also noticed that two gigantic black holes were growing alongside each other not far from the center of the coalescing galaxy, UGC 4211. Apparently, these black holes came across each other when their host galaxies collided. One of the black holes is around 200 million times the mass of our Sun, and the other is a bit smaller, about 125 million times the mass of our star. Even though they aren't visible directly, the black holes are surrounded by bright clusters of warm, glowing gas and stars, 
All of this has been tugged close by the black hole's gravitational pull. Times will pass, and these black holes will start circling each other. And eventually they will collide, creating one, probably even bigger black hole. Scientists have been observing these black holes across multiple wavelengths of light, and have come to the conclusion that they are kinda unique. They're located the closest to each other astronomers have ever seen. The distance between them is a mere 750 light years, which astronomically speaking, is just next door. Even more exciting, this distance is close to the limit of what modern technologies can detect. Interestingly, such ginormous merges are more typical for distant galaxies. This makes it harder for Earth-based telescopes to see them. But the sensitivity of ALMA helped astronomers observe those bright and compact regions where matter swirls around black holes. Imagine how surprised astronomers were when instead of one black hole, they saw two of them, munching on the dust and gas stirred up by the massive space merger. The most important thing about this discovery is that it may mean that such black hole binaries are likely to be much more common than we previously thought. And if pairs of black holes are so common, it might make it easier for us to study gravitational waves that occur when black holes collide. Such waves are also known as ripples in space-time. If we talk about the recently discovered pair of black holes, it might still take them several hundred million years to crash into each other. But by observing their behavior, scientists can figure out how many binary black holes that are about to collide exist in the universe. From where we stand, the sun seems so calm and peaceful. But like humans, and basically the whole living world, the sun has its own phases when it's more or less active. It's just that the consequences are way bigger and more chaotic when the sun becomes hyperactive. Let's zoom in to see what's happening up there. So one of the ways we measure the activity of our star is by counting sunspots on its surface. Sunspots are dark patches that form when the sun's magnetic field gets all tangled up. It's simple. The more sunspots, the more active our sun is. And it seems the sun has been partying like crazy recently. The number of sunspots scientists have seen is the highest for nearly 21 years. In June, 163 sunspots appeared on the sun's surface. The last time we had so many dark patches across the sun was in September 2002, when there were 187 of them. Uh-oh. It seems this chaotic party is getting closer to its peak. And that's something we call solar maximum. How does all this even happen? The sun's magnetic field is strong and organized at some point. But as we said, sometimes comes the time when it kinda ends up tangled. Sort of like a ball of rubber bands that are wound together very tightly. This also means plasma is rising from the surface, forming loops and causing a mess in the shape of solar flares and something we call coronal mass ejections, CME. That's when plasma in the sun's upper atmosphere, called the corona, goes crazy and bursts really strong. Then at some point, this ball snaps and completely flips and turns the south pole into the north pole and vice versa. All this happens every 11 years or so. So when the sun comes into this phase when it becomes very active, it shoots out hot blobs of plasma, gets big dark spots as large as planets, and releases powerful eruptions of energy and radiation. Something fascinating happens when the sun becomes more active. A thing called plasma waterfall or polar crown prominence, PCP. It's like a mini eruption that starts on the sun, and it seems like it tries to get away, but then the sun's magnetic field pulls it back before it can escape into space. And this plasma waterfall is really spectacular. It goes up to 62,000 miles above the surface. It's like you stack eight Earths on top of each other. Then there's something called a polar vortex. It's like a gigantic halo of plasma that rotates around the sun's north pole really fast. This vortex happens when a large tentacle of plasma snaps apart and falls back toward the surface, similar to how a plasma waterfall forms. Scientists don't know why this plasma stays above the sun's surface for so long. And one of the cool examples of CMEs was a giant one in the shape of a butterfly in March this year. It got such an unusual shape because it exploded on the side of the sun we couldn't see, so it was impossible to fully measure how strong it was. Fortunately, that one didn't explode in our direction, but it might have hit Mercury a little bit. And it's possible it knocked off some dust and gas since Mercury has a weak magnetic field. All this sounds cool in theory, but it's not such good news for us. Because of all this, we might experience more intense solar storms that can, again, lead to geomagnetic storms on Earth. 
And these don't just sound alarming, they indeed are. They create chaos and disrupt the magnetic field of our planet. Geomagnetic storms can create beautiful northern lights, true. But we'd all rather enjoy such beauties as the aurora borealis in regular conditions, or just watch a good old sunset above the ocean. It's not that every solar storm will necessarily hit Earth, even if there are more of them. To reach our planet, they must be pointed in the right direction at the right moment. But if that happens, the storm can ionize the upper atmosphere and bye-bye our communications. It can cause temporary blackouts for systems such as GPS and radio. It isn't necessarily a big problem on its own, but it can be very dangerous if it happens at the wrong time, like during a tsunami or an earthquake. The storms can also damage electrical infrastructure, like rail lines and power grids. If you're on a plane at that time, you might be exposed to higher levels of radiation. It's still not clear how dangerous that will be for you, but it can be a serious problem for astronauts in space. When solar storms mess with the magnetic field, this can affect the migrations of some animals, such as sea turtles, whales, and birds. Since things in the animal kingdom mostly work in the natural order, who knows how these animals go through or even survive such changes? And when the sun is at a maximum of its activity, satellites in space are in trouble too. We have more satellites in space than ever before. And when the upper atmosphere becomes denser because of all these changes, this can push satellites in different directions. They might crash into one another or some can even fall back to Earth, which again is only cool in movies with superheroes who can relatively easily deal with this stuff. Hopefully, we'll avoid a massive solar storm like the Carrington event. The story was similar. In August 1859, astronomers across the globe watched how the number of sunspots was getting bigger and bigger. A man named Richard Carrington was among them. At the beginning of September, he was sketching the sunspots when, out of a sudden, he was blinded by a flash of light. It lasted around five minutes, but it was spectacular. He later described it as a white light flare. It was a very strong coronal mass ejection CME, and in only 17.6 hours, this storm crossed the long way between the sun and our home planet, 90 million miles, and unleashed its force on us, even though this usually takes days. And when this storm started, telegraph machines across the world sparked. Operators got electric shocks and paper even caught fire. People were really scared and confused because they had never seen such bright skies before. Some even thought it was the end of the world. The next day, telegraph workers still couldn't work properly because Earth's atmosphere was still charged. They even managed to send messages using the auroral current instead of regular electricity. But it brought something incredible, two stunning auroras in the sky. People in Hawaii and Cuba could see beautiful northern lights, while those as far north as Chile could see the southern lights. It's all slowly but steadily escalating. Take solar flares, for example. These are powerful bursts of energy from the sun. In 2022, there were five times more of these flares compared to the previous year. Plus, the strongest ones, X-class flares, have been getting stronger and more common than before, too. And this might be way more extreme than anyone thought. Plus, it's likely to start a little bit earlier than we predicted. Scientists first thought the peak would happen in 2025, but it seems it could even occur by the end of 2023. We can't completely protect ourselves if a solar storm hits us directly, but we can still do some things like ground planes, adjust the paths of satellites in space, and try to make sure vulnerable infrastructure stays safe. To do all this, we need better solar weather forecasts to help us get ready for the worst. All this might sound very bad at first, but don't worry, solar flares won't destroy our planet. They do send charged solar material toward us at pretty high speeds, but it's not like we're completely doomed if these things hit us. Our planet won't leave us unprotected. We still have the atmosphere and magnetic field that keep us relatively safe. Our thick atmosphere is like a shield that blocks radiation that might harm us. So these solar flares can mostly affect technology, but they won't destroy Earth. I guess we have our own superheroes after all. Ah, consider the rogue planet, the cosmic wanderer that nobody wants to take home. Basically, a rogue planet is a planet that has been ejected from its own star system and is now floating aimlessly through space like a cosmic loner. These planets aren't just a theory. Scientists have actually detected some in our galaxy. 
In fact, estimates suggest that there may be lots of these cosmic nomads floating around the Milky Way. And they aren't just small rocky worlds like Earth. Some of them are actually massive gas giants, many times larger than Jupiter. These behemoths could potentially have their own moons, and even their own mini-systems orbiting around them. For example, one of the most famous rogue planets we know of has a complicated name. Here, you read it for yourself. It's located about 80 light-years away from Earth, and it was discovered in 2013. This rogue planet is estimated to be around 6 times the mass of Jupiter, and is believed to be around 12 million years old. And yes, just because these cosmic loners don't have a star, it doesn't mean they're super cold. They can still generate heat and light from their own internal processes. Some may even have magnetic fields and auroras, just like Earth. In other words, rogue planets could potentially be habitable, if they have the right conditions. So, what would life on such a planet look like? And could we potentially live in such a world? Well, living on a rogue planet can be a lonely existence. They have no warm sun to bask in, no cozy atmosphere to cuddle up in, and no cosmic neighbors to have barbecue with. That's why we'd have to get creative. Let's start with the most obvious problem. We'd have a hard time without light and heat. So how do we fix this? Well, we'd probably have to invest in some really fancy space heaters and wear fashionable super warm spacesuits. Or we could invent a whole new way to generate electricity without relying on solar power. For example, how about using geothermal energy? Now that's hot stuff! Each planet has an internal source of heat. Without it, they would all be nothing more than cold, lifeless rocks floating through space. This internal heat can be harnessed and used to power everything, from homes to factories to spaceships. It's like having a hot tub big enough to power an entire city. And that city, most likely, will be located underground, closer to the heat source. And as for light, well, we'd probably have to build some really bright flashlights. Or maybe even learn to genetically engineer some bioluminescent organisms to light up our homes. Just imagine, space space is overgrown with neon mushrooms and plants. By the way, speaking of plants, plant life would be pretty hard to come by without a star. So what would we eat? Well, we could use the same geothermal vents that we talked about, or some chemical reactions to sustain ourselves. And hey, maybe we'd develop a taste for sulfur-rich foods, or we'd start fermenting our own drinks from the bubbling volcanic mud. Yum! But besides food, we'd have a more important problem. Living on a rogue planet would be breathtaking, literally. We'd have no air. You see, not all rogue planets have good, stable atmospheres. It all depends on their size, composition, and other things. But even if our new home does have an atmosphere, it may be incredibly thin and unstable. We'd have no pretty blue skies or dramatic sunsets to admire. Instead, we'd be staring out into the infinite void of space, where the stars would be brighter than ever before. And forget about weather patterns. Without an atmosphere to create them, we'd have no rain, no snow, and no thunderstorms. And that's just some minor problems. What's worse, the temperature on the planet would be wildly fluctuating, swinging from unbearable heat to unbearable cold. It would be like living in an oven that's always being turned on and off. And finally, we'd be exposed to all kinds of space debris and cosmic radiation. So, if you don't want to get crispy, you might want to invest in some serious SPF. So, how do we fix it? Well, we'd have to find a way to generate our own oxygen and probably create something like a space-age biosphere. For example, we could grow some plants that could produce oxygen. Or we'd learn to filter the air like a high-tech air purifier. Finally, we have the last most important problem – finding water. And here's where the underwater oceans come to our aid. Now we're really diving deep into the possibilities. Nyuk, nyuk. But seriously, scientists suggest that some of these planets may indeed have underwater oceans. It would be like living on a giant water balloon that's been buried underground, with the ground beneath your feet made of ice and rock. In other words, we could just tap into these underground oceans. They could provide us with a source of water for drinking, farming, and manufacturing. 
maybe even with some other resources and materials we've never seen before. And by the way, who knows what kind of strange creatures might be lurking in those underground seas. But don't worry. Even if we don't have any underground oasis, there are also other options. We could get some water from comets, ice mining, and even from the atmosphere, the one we just created before. Finally, we need to find and mine some resources to build our homes and other stuff. And a rogue planet might not have the same kinds of resources as a planet that orbits a star. It's like trying to find some treasures in a desert. Not exactly a sure thing. We may have to rely on resources from nearby asteroids and things like that. And if we want to extract resources from the planet itself, we might need to drill down through miles of ice and rock. But hey, if you're up for the challenge, there'll always be a chance you'll strike it rich on a rogue planet. And who knows? Maybe you'll discover some new resources that are even more valuable than gold or diamonds. Great! Looks like we've solved the most important problems. Now, there may be other small difficulties. For example, we'd also have to deal with some seriously long days and nights, depending on how fast our planet was rotating. And we wouldn't have a normal, regular day-night cycle. The rotation of our planet could be wildly unpredictable. Maybe we'd have weeks-long nights, followed by weeks-long days, which could really mess with our sleep schedules. We might have to develop some really strong coffee to keep us going through those long, dark nights. But, hypothetically, we can adapt to all these things and overcome all the challenges. And now, finally, welcome to the rogue planet, where the sun never rises, but the adventures never end. Thanks to our advanced technology, we've managed to create a comfortable and habitable environment in this once barren world. The sky above us is now a beautiful shade of blue, filled with fluffy white clouds and the occasional flock of flying creatures. Don't ask. As we venture out from our underground habitats, we're greeted by a world that's full of surprises. Strange plants and animals have adapted to the unique conditions of this planet, some with bioluminescent features that glow in the dark. And be careful if you want to go swimming in the underground ocean. They might be home to some bizarre creatures who want to feast on… well, we'll come back to that. Maybe. As you can see, we've created sprawling cities and thriving communities powered by the planet's geothermal energy. We also created a bunch of artificial light sources that keep things bright throughout the dark, chilly nights. Of course, we still have some problems with navigation and timekeeping, but things aren't as dull as they used to be, are they? Overall, living on a rogue planet would definitely have its challenges, but it could also be a pretty exciting way to experience the universe. And who knows? Maybe someday we'll find such a planet and actually turn it into a bustling intergalactic metropolis someday. But until then, let's enjoy and tidy up our dear Earth. Look at this star. It lies at the heart of its system and makes up 99.8% of its mass. It's a relatively young star and part of a generation of stars known as Population 1. Yep, there's an older star generation called Population 2, and an even older, and not even proven, Population 3. Anyway, this star was born around 4.6 billion years ago. It most likely formed from a giant, rotating cloud of dust and gas. Such clouds of space matter are called nebulas. One day, the nebula started spinning faster and faster because of the force of its own gravity, and then it flattened into a disk and most of the material got pulled towards the center, forming a star. But it's all in the past. Right now, you see a ginormous comet flying towards the star. Are they going to collide? Well, it's time to reveal all secrets. The star I'm talking about is our Sun, and the comet approaching it at a breakneck speed is 96P Machholz 1. The comet is around 3.7 miles wide, Astronomers think it might have arrived from outside the solar system. The NASA ESA Solar and Heliospheric Observatory spacecraft is monitoring the comet as it's dashing towards our star. Right now, it's moving inside Mercury's orbit, leaving an icy trail as it's nearing the Sun. Now, look at this. That's the comet's trail. It's mostly made up of gas, 
It's trickling behind the frozen chunks of ice that are getting heated by the radiation coming from the sun. In some cases, a comet can have two tails, one made of dust and the other consisting of gas. And each of them can reach hundreds and, in some extreme situations, even millions of miles in length. In 2008, scientists analyzed the material left by 150 comets. They found out that the comet we're talking about was quite low in carbon and didn't contain a large enough amount of some other typical materials. This could only mean one thing. The comet was an interloper coming from another star system. It may have been ejected from its original solar system by the gravity of a large planet. After that, the poor homeless celestial body probably spent a large amount of time wandering space until it came across Jupiter. The gas giant could have bent the comet's trajectory, trapping it in orbit around the sun. There's one more theory. According to it, the comet formed in a poorly studied region of the solar system, and it has this weird composition due to its repeated journeys around the sun. Now, scientists are watching the comet with bated breath. They're sure that once it collides with the sun, they'll be able to learn new information about this space wanderer. And since the comet is an atypical one, both in its behavior and composition, they don't know what they will see, which makes the whole process even more exciting. David Machholz, yes, that's the one who the comet was named after, first noticed this space body in 1986 with the help of a homemade cardboard telescope. The most surprising thing about this discovery is that most comets falling towards the sun are quite small, not more than 32 feet across. That's why they burn up as soon as they come close to the sun, but the sheer size of Machholz 1, which is more than two-thirds the height of Mount Everest, seems to protect the comet from evaporating completely. The SOHO has already recorded the comet making five close passes around the sun. The most recent one happened on January 31st, 2023. The giant comet was three times closer to the sun than Mercury. But what would happen if a space body like this one crashed into our star? There is a special name for comets that come too close to the sun, sun grazers. They can pass a few thousand miles away from the star's surface. At the same time, we know that the sun doesn't have a surface. It's a giant ball of immensely hot gases, mostly hydrogen. Comets that get too close to the star can pass through its Roche limit. After this border, space travelers usually get ripped apart by incredibly strong gravitational forces, or at least that's what happens to small or structurally weak comets. But our comet is neither weak nor small. It can potentially survive the sun's gravity and cross the Roche limit again, leaving the dangerous zone. But such comets have other problems because solar radiation and heat are powerful enough to crack rocks. So imagine 96P Machholz 1 speeding towards the sun. It's moving faster and faster, crossing the Roche limit. And it looks as if it's not gonna stop. Soon, it's dashing at a speed of 370 miles per second. And then, boom! The comet gets flattened by the sun's atmosphere. This generates a truly spectacular explosion. It throws out countless tidal waves of X-rays and ultraviolet radiation. This explosion unleashes as much energy as a coronal mass ejection or a powerful magnetic flare. The momentum makes the sun ring like a bell. Then a series of sunquakes echo through the solar atmosphere. And that's what might happen if a massive comet crashes into our star. Scientists admit that their theories are just speculations. For one thing, a sun-hitting comet hasn't been seen yet. Plus, no one is sure what physics will determine its fate. Astronomers know about comets that came pretty close to the sun and survived this feat. For example, in 2011, it was a comet named Lovejoy. It passed through the corona, the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere, usually hidden by the blindingly bright light of the surface of our star. When the comet emerged, it was much worse to wear, that's true, but it was still intact. Another comet that survived this dangerous approach, though barely, was Ison, and it happened in 2014. 
So, what does a comet need to reach the sun's lower atmosphere? A mass of more than 1 million tons. This lower limit is about 100 times smaller than comets Lovejoy and Ison. There are long-period comets that take more than 200 years to orbit the sun. Scientists think they might originate in the Oort cloud. It's the most distant region of the solar system, its outskirts, so to speak. It's a collection of icy objects farther away from us than anything else in the solar system. It lies at a distance between 2,000 and 100,000 astronomical units away from the sun, and 1 AU is around 93 million miles. This region is also described as a cometary reservoir. No wonder, according to some estimates, there are more than a trillion icy objects there. So, some of them are bound to wander off, right? You can also find an estimated trillion or even more comets in the Kuiper Belt. This region lies beyond the orbit of Neptune. It's a donut-shaped ring of icy objects surrounding the Sun, 30 to 55 AU from our star. Short-period comets that take less than 200 years to orbit the Sun appear there. The first mission to explore this distant region was New Horizons. Right now, it remains deep in the Kuiper Belt, speeding away from Earth at a rate of about 300 million miles per year. There are also dwarf planets dwelling inside the Kuiper Belt. Some of them have their own moons. And this egg-shaped planet, Haumea, even has a ring of its own. By the way, a dwarf planet's atmosphere can collapse if its orbit takes it far away from the Sun. A bonus fact, even though you might not have noticed it, we live inside the Sun. No, I didn't mean that we literally inhabit the star that is 93 million miles away. The thing is, the Sun's atmosphere stretches far beyond its visible surface, and our planet is right within its reach. In fact, exactly the gust of solar winds creates such a breathtaking phenomenon as the northern and southern lights. On the 2nd of September 2023, India launched its first space probe to study the Sun. This solar mission is called Aditla L1. It's going to travel almost 1 million miles and join four other spacecraft that are currently circling a point in space known as Lagrange Point 1. But this Indian mission is different from the rest. How come? Experts call this mission a unique observatory, all because it combines instruments that can shed light on not one, but on three crucial questions. The first one is how stars like our Sun sustain their insanely hot outer layer. The next mystery that confuses scientists is how exactly the Sun's magnetic field produces such severe solar storms. And the last one is how the variations in the magnetic field of our star affect the atmosphere of our planet. Aditla L1 has seven instruments that can help observe the layers of the Sun. For example, with the help of electromagnetic and particle detectors, the probe will examine the Sun's corona, which is the outer layer of the star. While doing it, the spacecraft will be hovering at a safe distance from the Sun, around 92 million miles. Researchers hope that the mission will be able to gather data on the properties of the corona and figure out what causes coronal mass ejections. Those are enormous bursts of electrons, ions, and magnetic fields. The probe is also expected to examine the Sun's lower atmosphere and the boundary between the atmosphere and the interior of the star. Everyone is waiting for the data from the mission with bated breath, especially from its Solar Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope. No wonder, it can help to study solar winds and the way they accelerate, as well as coronal heating. This telescope can also potentially provide images of the Sun's disk in the near ultraviolet for the first time ever. This disk is the outer visible layer of gas and dust surrounding the Sun. One of the mission's tasks is to help scientists figure out how the dynamics within the corona and the Sun's lower atmosphere drive space weather. You see, our star has a massive and pretty complex magnetic field which wanes and strengthens again, reaching its peak every 11 years or so. When it happens, the north and south poles of the field flip. The current cycle is predicted to reach its maximum in 2024 or 2025. It means that solar activity is going to keep rising in the next few years, making this period perfect for collecting data.
There are five Lagrange points in space where the gravity between two bodies, in our case between the Sun and Earth, cancels out. It means that a spaceship can remain there with minimal use of fuel, and L1, which is the goal of Adida L1, offers a great view of the Sun as a benefit. The Indian space probe is going to join four other craft orbiting L1. The satellite is supposed to reach its orbit in the middle of January, and by the end of February, scientists hope to start getting regular reports. The probe is expected to send around 1,440 images per day to the ground station, where these pictures will be analyzed. Adita L1 isn't the only spacecraft exploring the Sun. Probably the most famous one is NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Its main goal is to touch the Sun. It's flying closer to the surface of our star than any other spacecraft before. Astronomers hope that this mission will revolutionize our understanding of the Sun. For one thing, the distance between the probe and the surface of our star is more than seven times smaller than that between the Sun and any other spaceship. Plus, over seven years of hard work, Parker is supposed to complete 24 orbits around the Sun. And at its closest approach, the spacecraft will hang out around 3.9 million miles away from the Sun which, in this situation, is very close. And its speed will be about 430,000 miles per hour. If you moved at this same speed, you'd get from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in just one second. The Parker Solar Probe has its instruments protected from the sun by a 4.5-inch thick carbon composite shield. It can withstand temperatures of around 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. But what exactly does the probe do? It dives into the scorching atmosphere of our star, having to withstand insane heat and radiation just to give us a glimpse of what this atmosphere is like. In 2021, NASA announced that the probe had flown through the corona, the sun's upper atmosphere. Parker managed to take samples of magnetic fields and particles there. It was the first time ever when a spaceship touched the sun. The probe was designed to travel within 4 million miles of the surface of our star, tracing the flow of energy, studying the heating of the corona, and exploring the acceleration of the solar wind. Hopefully, we'll get the answers to a few long-standing questions, like why is the sun's corona much hotter than the star's surface? What makes the solar wind accelerate? And what is the source of those high-energy solar particles? It's hard to believe, but we actually live in the sun's atmosphere. At first sight, our star looks like a bright, self-contained sphere hanging out somewhere far away in space. But that visible edge is just the beginning. The Sun's hot corona reaches way past Earth, all the way to Pluto and even beyond. You can't normally see this corona. It's visible only during a total eclipse. But believe me, it's there. The corona has its own weather. Billion-ton coronal mass ejections occur there. High-energy radiation storms rage from the sun's upper atmosphere. Relentless solar winds can reach a speed of a million miles per hour. And every comet, asteroid, and even planet in the solar system is affected by those elements. The sun still has a lot of surprises for us. For example, recently, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory has discovered a large coronal hole in the southern part of our star's outer atmosphere. The temperature there can reach millions of degrees Fahrenheit. Such giant coronal holes can have a dramatic impact on our planet. They mean that the sun produces and sends off streams of gas that can easily reach Earth. This can result in geomagnetic storms triggering disturbances in the atmosphere. At the same time, such solar flares also produce some of the most beautiful phenomena on Earth, the aurora borealis. But since the flares affect our planet's magnetic field, they can have an impact on GPS mapping, satellite television signals, and even cell phone transmission. How bad it gets depends on the intensity of solar flares. Another rather frequent occurrence of this natural phenomenon is power grid outages. Luckily, Earth's magnetic field does a great job protecting us from solar flares. But sometimes, the flares are just too powerful to go unnoticed. Some of them can release 10 million times more energy than the most powerful volcanic eruptions. Within a few minutes, one flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. 
solar flares are also insanely hot. Their temperatures can reach several million degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the following news may sound scary, but there are also super flares. In comparison to them, our sun's bursts of radiation are small potatoes. Super flares mostly occur in young and active stars. In 2016, astronomers saw such a phenomenon. A star 1,500 light years away from Earth produced a flare that was 10 billion times more powerful than any of those that burst from our sun. It doesn't mean we're safe here on Earth. Even our middle-aged sun knows how to produce super flares. But while young stars can have them once a week or even more often, for the sun, it's once in a few thousand years. And still, if people don't figure out how to protect the planet, just one super flare can shred our ozone layer and wipe out life on Earth. Or not. Is it possible to put out the sun? For example, what would happen if we poured all of the Earth's oceans on it? Or even more water? Well, let's find out. The universe is a place full of mysteries. Since ancient times, scientists have been arguing about how space works. But none of us has ever doubted the existence of one thing, the sun. Ah, the center of our solar system. It's big, bright, and immortal? Nah, not really. Actually, the sun is just an ordinary star. It consists of 75% hydrogen, a little helium, and a pinch of other heavy elements. Gravity holds it all together. But in around 5 billion years, the life cycle of the sun will come to an end. The hydrogen inside it will run out. Our star will begin to grow gradually. And you can't even imagine just how big it will become. And then it will start eating all the nearby planets. That's when we'll regret being so close to it. After eating us all, the star will remain a red giant for another billion years or so. And then, sooner or later, it will begin to shrink and fade, turning into a white dwarf. In the end, nothing will remain of it but a bright and colorful planetary nebula. But don't get scared. Right now, the sun is in the middle of its life cycle. It was born about 4.5 billion years ago, and about the same amount of time remains. Fortunately, we were born during the star's best and most stable period. In other words, there's no reason to worry. So let's find one. How about speeding up the sun's life cycle with the help of water? We'll try to collect all the water on Earth and pour it onto the sun. First, we'll need a bucket. No, not this one. We'll need a really, really big bucket. The one that can contain around 326 million cubic miles of water. It will be equal in size to the distance from Washington to Chicago. Or if we can only find ordinary buckets, there should be around 70 quintillion of them. This is a number with 18 zeros. Okay, imagine that we magically got that many buckets. It's time to put out the sun. We splash the star with all this water and nothing? Seriously? Oh, just look at this. The sun has probably felt sorry for us and produced one little solar flare. It turns out that all water on Earth is actually just a pathetic drop for the sun. People often underestimate how much bigger the sun really is than our planet. In reality, it can fit more than 1,003,000 Earths. So yes, the sun won't go out or even get colder. It won't even notice that we've done something. But let's not give up. We really want the sun to go out for some reason. What happens if we pour just enough water on it? And how much is this enough? Remember our quintillions of buckets? Well, we actually need about 370 octillions of them. This number has 27 zeros. It's hard to even imagine, so let's just say that it's a lot of water. Now, let's splash it all over the sun again. Wow, just look at the steam. But the sun hasn't gone out again. On the contrary, it said thank you and suddenly became much bigger and brighter. What's happening? You see, the sun isn't actually a campfire. Inside bonfires, candle flames, there's a chemical combustion. When we pour water on the fire, the water absorbs the heat of the flame and cools it to such an extent that it can no longer maintain the burning reaction. It also blocks the fire's access to oxygen. Water basically stops the chemical process. But the burning of the sun isn't the same reaction. 
Even though we say it burns, it's not entirely true. What happens there is called nuclear fusion. It's one of the most violent and craziest reactions in the universe. There are many layers of hydrogen going deep into the sun. If you take four hydrogen atoms and ram them together, you're left with an atom of helium. When we talk about the sun, the process is a little more complicated. When the star tries to carry out that fusion, positive protons repel each other. It takes a lot of force and energy to somehow squeeze them together. Fortunately, there's a magical force in space. It's gravity. The sun takes up 99.8% of all the mass of the solar system. Pretty heavy, right? And all this mass is what holds the sun together with the help of an incredible gravitational force. So, gravity takes quadrillions of these little hydrogen atoms and pushes them together every second of every day. And when they collide, they release some energy. So, unlike fire, the sun doesn't need oxygen to live. It needs hydrogen. And we all know that water is H2O. It consists of hydrogen and oxygen. So this is literally fuel for the sun. It's like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. More importantly, the extra mass added by water will make the sun heavier. Now, gravity says, thank you for your help. And then it starts to collide protons with each other even faster. And thanks to this, the synthesis speeds up. Great, we've made the sun incredibly strong and now it has eaten us, along with other nearby planets. And if we keep adding water, the sun will sooner or later collapse in on itself. It will blow off its outer layers and become a black hole. Awesome. Now it will pull inside absolutely everything around. Good job, guys. Let's press rewind because clearly our water experiment was a mistake. One small solar flare sounds much better. All right, we're back to our usual calm sun. But it seems like there's something that we forgot. Well, apparently, water was critically important for life on Earth. Who would have thought? Now there's a huge amount of unmoving fish and other marine creatures lying around where the oceans used to be. Poor things. As for deep sea creatures, they simply didn't withstand such a sharp change in pressure. Algae and corals have also dried up. Wait a minute, weren't they responsible for producing 50 to 80% of the world's oxygen? Oops, it's time to put on some oxygen masks. And how are things on dry land? I mean, now everything is just land. But you get the point. Wow, this whole place is lit, and I mean it literally. If there are no oceans, then there are no clouds or rain. Now there are forest fires everywhere. Poor animals have to escape and leave their homes. Oh my. And it's not like they'll be able to find a new home, because all plants, of course, will dry up quickly. There will be literally no place for living left on the planet. So now, Earth looks like a giant desert. Great! But people have been living in deserts for thousands of years, right? Maybe they'll know what to do. They won't. After all, people in the desert also need to drink. So now, there's total chaos everywhere, and survivors fight for the last drops of water. If there are any survivors at all. In fact, no matter how much they fight for resources, their fate is sealed. The ocean absorbs a huge amount of CO2 and the heat coming from the sun. They also distribute this heat throughout the planet, making it pleasant to live on. But once they're gone, the temperatures will quickly jump to 250 degrees Fahrenheit and above. But even if we forget about the high temperatures, now we have no clouds and they helped us too, by not letting through solar radiation. So we're also under the direct impact of the sun's rays. Our last hope is icebergs. Now that everything is terribly hot, they've melted. And maybe they'll be the last hope for humanity. But that cool solar flare was definitely worth it. Silly humans. Hey, ready to test your knowledge? Of course you are. You'll get one point for each correct answer. So without further ado, the sun is yellow. Do you think this is a myth? Ask someone to draw a picture of the sun, and chances are you'll get a yellow or orange circle in the sky. Surprise! The sun is not really yellow. If you see it somewhere outside the Earth's atmosphere, it'll look white. How come? According to NASA, the sun's temperature is the reason why it's white. 
The sun consists of all colors mixed together, so it appears to our eyes as white. Then why do you think we see it as yellow or orange from Earth? Colored wavelengths, which are yellow and orange, are longer, and they are the only ones that make it to our eyes. The other short wavelength colors sprawl in the atmosphere, and the sky looks blue to us during the day for the same reason. Meteorites are hot as fire when they land on Earth. What do you think, myth or fact? When people see a fireball around a meteorite, they think it's super hot. Well, this is a myth. Meteorites don't immediately land on Earth. Most of them have been in space for billions of years. Space has a cold environment, just a few degrees above absolute zero cold, you know. But don't meteorites fall into the Earth in flames? How come? The fireball is actually the air in front of the meteorite. It is compressed by the super high speed of the meteorite. The outside catches fire, but that layer is burned off on impact as a result of landing on Earth. As you would probably guess, when they land, the meteorites are lukewarm at most, but not as hot as lava. One side of the moon is permanently in the dark. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? This is a myth. Oh, come on. First the sun and now the moon. Am I living a lie? (laughs) So people look at the sky and see only the bright side of the moon. The reality is the Earth shines equally on all sides of the moon as it rotates and orbits the Earth. Half of the moon is in shadow, and half gets sunshine similar to Earth. That's not true. Similar to Earth, it doesn't have a permanent dark side. The logic is simple. The moon orbits Earth, but it also rotates on its own axis. When you think about it, we're always looking at the same side of the moon. Black holes take in everything that comes their way. What is it? Myth or fact? Black holes don't have infinite mass and gravitational force. But still, no one really knows for sure what happens to the things pulled into them. Experts do know black holes do not have supergravity, though. Let's imagine this. If there was a black hole as big as the sun, it wouldn't immediately eat the whole planet. Imagine black holes as vacuum cleaners. It does draw in a cloud of dust near its range, but other specks of dust remain where they are. So even if there was a black hole replacing the sun, all the planets would continue to orbit similarly. They wouldn't go into the black hole. If a star or something else got into the range of the black hole, only then would its gravity affect the star. When you call someone, the signal bounces off a satellite. Is this a myth or a fact? Yep, it's a myth. Or rather, an urban legend or misconception, you name it. I mean, there are some satellite phones, but we, you know, regular people, don't use those every day. Although, your mobile phone works in a much different way. When you call someone, the nearest tower connects you to the other person online. This is why there are tower connections, huge networks of tower-to-tower connections, and hidden cables. The moon has no gravity. Any guesses? Myth or fact? This is an urban legend. Ask any astronaut you know. If you don't know any, just trust me. There is footage proving that the moon has gravity. When I say the moon has gravity, don't think it's similar to the gravity on Earth that makes the apple fall. The moon's gravity is only about one-sixth of Earth's. How does it feel to walk on the surface of the moon? The second man on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, mentioned it's like moving in slow motion and, quote, perhaps not too far from a trampoline, but without the springiness and instability, end quote. The sunset on Mars appears blue. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? This is a fact! Magnificent sunsets. The sky is filled with different shades of yellow. Now, imagine this in blue. According to NASA, sunsets on Mars would look bluish, watching them with bare eyes. It's because of dust. Dust particles closer to the sun appear in blue tones. There is something called moonquakes. Does it sound like a myth or a fact? It's a fact. Quakes happen on the moon, too. And they're called moonquakes. They have different features, not really similar to the quakes on Earth, though. A planet can be hot enough to vaporize rocks. Any guesses? Is this a myth or a fact? This is a fact. The temperature in this universe is indeed very high. 
there's a planet, the temperature of which is enough to melt and even vaporize rocks. It's two times bigger than the Earth. This super-Earth is similar to our planet, but it is way too hot. Experts believe that it possibly has oceans of lava and clouds that rain molten rock. One million Earths can fit inside the sun. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? This is a fact. Although the sun is one of more than 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, which is at the heart of our solar system, it can fit one million Earths. Yeah, it looks small when we see it from here. But it's only because it's so far away from Earth. All comets have tails. Myth or fact? It's true. Some comets simply don't show their tails. They look like someone threw a snowball into space. Space is completely silent. What do you say? Shh, I knew it was too easy. This is a fact. Space doesn't have an atmosphere, so there's no way to hear any sound there. Mercury is the hottest planet. Myth or fact? Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, so this should be a fact, huh? No, not really. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system and the second planet from the Sun. But the distance from the Sun isn't what defines the temperature. The heat depends on the atmosphere. So Venus's atmosphere consists mostly of carbon dioxide and some nitrogen. This combination makes the atmosphere very thick. When I say thick, I mean it. Throughout the year, the surface of Venus maintains a temperature of around 860 degrees Fahrenheit. Mercury's surface resembles the temperature of a desert, but is much higher in terms of temperature variations. Venus spins clockwise. What do you say? This is a fact. Venus spins in the opposite direction compared to many other planets. The Sun rises in the west, and its rotation is very slow. Venus needs 225 Earth days to complete its spinning around the Sun. The planet's distance from the Sun affects the duration of one rotation. It's too close to the Sun, and the Sun has a strong, noticeable pull on the planets. Footprints on the Moon can stay there for millions of years. Do you think this is a fact or a myth? Fact checked! The Moon has no atmosphere, so there's no wind blowing. And without the wind, there's no way to erase the footprints without any intervention. So, how many points did you get? Let me know in the comments. It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoar frost appears on the ground, the grass, and the trees. And ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky and their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky, and the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the Sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the Sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the Sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the Sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the Sun, 
its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the Sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the Sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else, since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they'd both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. 
despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the sun, and even the presence of the moon in its skies, all of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay?